Hi, welcome to Fiverr Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. My guest today is from Ireland, Kathy Ross. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Irina. Thank you so much for inviting me on to your show. Oh, my um, pleasure. It's lovely to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. So I've, I, like the first time I saw your account on Instagram, I was absolutely blown away just because you have such a unique touch to your art, right? It's not just one thing. It's like such a mixed medium. So you originally started as an artist, right? Yeah, that's right, Irina. Um, I doubled, stumbled into the world of textiles and fiber arts about four years ago. Um, I had gone to the National College of Art and Design in Ireland and studied fine art print. So it was, you know, it was all on paper. There wasn't, you know, textiles or fabrics or thread involved in any of it. And then I relocated back home to the west of Ireland and um, to Galway and I established myself as a watercolour artist. So I was having lots of exhibitions and they were going really well. But I was extremely frustrated with the two dimensional quality of the work. So um, I'd seen I'd always been in love with embroidery. So when I was a teenager, I used to experiment with it quite a lot. And I had a big exhibition about six years ago. And afterwards, I kind of needed something just to refuel my creativity. So I started playing around with uh, stitching through my sketches and um, I just fell in love immediately. Um, it's, it's just kind of grown from there. And the more I do of it, the more I love. And I think it's it's nice to have that background that's, you know, it's it's not really textiles because you're you're almost educating yourself as you go along. And you're not afraid of breaking the rules because you don't know the rules, you know, so um, it's, it's a really organic process. Let's go back to that teenage years. So you, yeah. you mentioned to me that when you were 11, your teacher yeah. was teaching how to embroider and the, yeah. she actually entered you into some competition the whole class. yeah so when when I was 11 I learned embroidery and um, they it's, it's very unusual because in in primary or elementary schools in Ireland they don't tend to teach any textiles but this one teacher um she taught us the basic embroidery stitches and then it was probably two years later another teacher um brought us back to do embroidery again and she she um it wasn't the, the, the project that she entered me into the competition for, you could use any medium, but I'd chosen textiles. So um, the theme of the uh, competition was uh, ele electricity for life. So I made a Frankenstein out of a pair of my mom's old tights. She put them into the washing machine and they went green. And when they came out, I was like, oh, I'm going to use these. So um, I sewed it all together and I used um, electrical fuses and old plugs and stitched all these into the tapestry as well and the it won the competition so it was amazing and it got exhibited in one of Ireland's most renowned galleries the Hume Lane Gallery as well so that kind of really fueled things for me for a little while when I was a teenager. Do you, do you remember that moment when you like decided to add to your painting and try to do like stitching to add to it like what was that was it like a light bulb like the electricity coming back like the was it in yeah the it was it was it was really funny um you know like you use instagram like i do arena and um sometimes things just come up in your feeds and you go oh i really want to try that and there was there was embroidery coming up in my feeds and I hadn't been looking for it and I, I just all all of a sudden remembered I used to do that I used to love doing that so um it was actually the first sketch that I stitched into I remember it so vividly it was um, an old stone wall and it had loads of brambles growing over it and I remember looking at the brambles and thinking wouldn't they be so cool stitched because it's kind of the similar feel of that that prickly texture so I started stitching through this really really thick paper and oh my god my hands were raw afterwards and that's where the machine came into it I'm quite lazy so when I realized I could use um, a sewing machine to draw that really just opened things up for me so like okay so you go from that one moment right of just like okay. an idea and then you turn it, your entire business suddenly went from just being a painter to just being an artist to like suddenly becoming a fiber artist and adding it. What was that pro process like? Like, was there something that didn't work or was it like immediately everything was beautiful? No, 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 no. <laughs> like I look back on my early pieces and I'm just like shamed 
by them. You know, there were so many problems um, with puckering um, you know, where the, the material would fray or I'd get lots of bird nesting, all these problems that free motion embroiderers would have. And my way around it was to, to research. So every time I had a problem, like I didn't know it was called bird nesting. So I would Google uh, free motion embroidery, messy back and, you know, figure out, OK, why is this happening? And then I learned about tension and I learned about all those things. And the more you practice, I think, with any craft, the more you learn from it. And so that was that was a big problem at the beginning was learning the tension. Um, and then it was even precision. So when I initially started, I was I was doing a lot of needle felting. And I love the effect of it, but I, I almost felt like it was a little bit blurry. So the embroidery came into it from that, where, you know, I could add these stitches into it to make the picture more uh, clarified or, you know, more detailed. So all of these explorations just lent to the work a little bit more. And I just think through practice and research, you, you learn so much. Right. Well, I read process. somewhere that like your biggest um, sort of problem is having enough colors in your threads yeah. <laughs> because you don't find the exact shade that you're looking for like do you feel like being an artist makes it easier for you or makes it more difficult for you because you're looking at every embroidery with the eye of an artist yeah I think I think my, being an artist does make it more difficult because you know, you're trained to see the colors and, you know, you might be looking at an animal and you'll look at their nose and you could see, OK, the nose is black. But when there is highlights in it, that's white, but it's also pale blue and it's gray and it's purple and it's pink. And so when you start really looking, all you're doing is changing thread every few seconds on the machine. And when I began the process, I found that really frustrating because if you're working with paint and a palette, you can go, OK, I have my black and I have my blue and I have my white. I can mix them all together till I get the right tone. Whereas a thread, it's more complicated. Um, I have such a huge thread collection over here. <laughs> but um, I found that over the years, I've learned to, to almost blend them like paint so I can use like a white and then leave a gap and then use a black up against it. And it totally changes the way the thread looks. Um, and certain, I've, I've also learned that certain subjects really lend themselves to fiber art and to embroidery. And um, like, if you look on the wall behind me, it's mainly animals. I love wildlife, absolutely entranced by them. And fur and feathers, they all look magnificent in threads. So it's, it's great to kind of, try and capture those with textiles it's difficult to figure out when to stop like oh yeah 100 <laughs> percent <laughs> that's a that's a big problem i think is knowing when to stop and also it's so addictive um i don't know about you arena but my my studio is in my home so you know i have been guilty of getting up at three o'clock in the morning if i'm thinking about a project and coming in and doing a few hours so that can be tricky is knowing when to stop and to step away from the project is it difficult for you to sell your art in in two senses one is to like let's talk about finding the audience but also because you invest so much of yourself into every piece to let go of it yeah definitely um i have one or two pieces that i i haven't been able to sell for the emotional connection um, at the start of the first lockdown during the pandemic, um, I decided I all my embroideries are quite small, like the ones behind me, and I'd never done anything really colossal. And I thought, okay, well, why haven't I done anything really big? So um, I just started working on this stag, and he was one and a half meters by one and a half meters, um, a giant art quilt. So the, the whole body of the stag was all embroidered. I think it took about a month and a half just to embroider his body and then I hand painted the backing fabric and then the kids wanted to get involved because they were bored because they were off school so they cut out all the leaves for the trees in the background and I raw edge appliqued all those on so the whole project took an entire summer and then I just I couldn't get rid of it you know I just said no this is not for sale a because there's so many hours put into it I don't know how I would even go about pricing it 
but B, you know, the kids got involved in it. We were all talking about it the whole way through lockdown. So it really, we had such a connection to the piece that we couldn't let it go. So now it's actually hanging in our living room. We love it. And it's really funny because at Christmas time, we put a big red felt nose on it and turned That's it into really <laughs> um, But smaller pieces, um, you know, you were asking about how to find your audience and, um, you know, how to sell your work. I think that can be difficult as well with embroidery. Um, having come from an art background or a fine art background where I was selling my watercolours, you know, and watercolour paintings, and then for my audience to all of a sudden see me go, oh, she's doing something totally different. That was quite strange. Um, and I didn't know if I was doing the right thing artistically when I started doing the embroidery. So I said, OK, I'm going to give myself a year. I'm going to see what the audience I have thinks of this work. Um, and if they're receptive to it, I can keep going. And they were immediately receptive to it, which was very lucky for me, I suppose, as an artist. Um, initially, I started making like little landscapes of the town that we live in here, which is called Galway. It's right on the coast and we have these traditional sailing boats and beautiful skies. So that's what I started with, was making really dramatic needle felted skies and metallic seas and they went really well and it, you know almost immediately I'd put one up on my website and they'd be sold and um, so that was great but I do find sometimes it can be difficult to get the customer now to value the amount of time that goes into a piece so sometimes you could spend you know 40 50 60 hours on one piece and then you have to price that accordingly so that can be sometimes difficult to explain to them and it's you know. difficult for you personally, because when you paint something, right, it doesn't, you don't price it by the hour. No, no you but don't. And then when you add embroidery, so it suddenly goes from like arts to crafts almost, and yeah. you have to add the hours that you spend on it. Is it difficult for you personally, not for the customer, but for you to say that the painting, oh, I would charge that much, but like on top of it, I spend that many hours? Yeah, it, it is a difficult process. And actually, I've been I've been, you know, talking to people about this quite a lot recently. And, you know, it's funny you say that, you know, embroidery is a craft and sometimes that can seem like a dirty word to people. But I think it needs to be totally embraced because, as you said, when it's a craft like embroidery, there's so many hours put into it. All of the people who work on these pieces, they're, you know, they're striving to kind of create something that's really unique. And paintings are very unique as well. You know, they're amazing and it's all about colour too. But I think sometimes with something like craft, it's longer hours. There's so much more thought going into it. Even the process is just, it's just hard work. And it can be difficult. But I think, you know, if you have a little formula where you go, okay, my 10-inch pieces are going to cost this price and my 12 inch pieces are this price and then go by how long it's also taking you to make it and so long as you can detach yourself emotionally from the piece it's not too bad but yes I have got certain pieces that I just can't I can't let go I just love them <laughs> well when you decide on what you're going to make next is pricing ever on your mind or because like you can the yeah. reason I'm asking right like you can make something that looks sophisticated looks beautiful but it doesn't take that many hours or you can make a really tiny piece that's going to take you forever and a half yeah like do you think about that or is artist prevail I think I think about it maybe 30 percent of the time if I had to give a percentage to it and um, so obviously you know I have family I have kids I have bills to pay like everyone else so 30% of the time I might think, oh yeah, I'm going to make one of these now because I know that that will sell and that people would like to see that. And the other 70% of the time, it's just me making things that I want to make because they speak to me. And if they sell, that's great. And if they don't, you know, we learn from that and we move on and I've made something that I want, want to make. So it's cathartic from a creative point of view as well. Have you ever yeah, yeah. made something that you were like positive it's going to sell, it's going to be your best seller, it's going to be super popular and nothing happened? Um, 
I'm trying to think. So at the moment, I'm making a collection of pieces, but I actually haven't put them up for sale. So I don't know if that's the same thing. Um, sometimes I, I kind of like to, to make like maybe seven or eight pieces and then just sit on them for a little while. Like I'll share the process on Instagram as I'm making them, but I won't have them available to buy, we'll say, for a little while. So the the um the collection that I'm making at the moment, um, people who follow along with me would be familiar with them. They're rainbow animals, I suppose you'd call them. So um last year we got some wildlife cameras close to where I live and we put them out and all the animals seem to come out at dusk. So you're not getting a colourful image still of the animals. So I like to reimagine what they look like. So maybe a squirrel, you know, a red squirrel who isn't a red squirrel. He's got purples and pinks and reds and yellows and all of those colours through them. And most of my artwork that sells really quickly would be the more natural tone pieces. So for me, this is again like moving on from the painting to the embroidery. It's trying something new and kind of going, oh, gee, Chris, am I doing the right thing? Um, it's a funny one. Um, at Christmas time, I released maybe two pieces in the collection just to see would they go. And the original pieces I still have, but I also released prints of all the embroideries and all of the prints went straight away. So, yeah, it's, 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 it is a funny, it's a great question, Arena. You know, is there pieces? I'd say there is. And, you know, if I go through my portfolio, which I keep hidden in that cupboard behind, so I don't look at what kind of doesn't go. Um, I'm sure there are pieces that, that maybe I put my heart and soul into and didn't sell. When you teach others how to do it, yes, was it difficult for you to figure out how to teach? Because like what, you know, it's like sometimes we can do stuff and it's like you can be amazing at what you do, but like to teach is a whole different animal and to, to know how to explain the whole process step by step to somebody who doesn't know it. Like, did you, what was the whole teaching experience for you like? I approached it very differently to like I, I actually teach kids art classes so when I go into those classes it's more kind of seeing what the kids want to do and following on for that whereas with this because with free motion embroidery you need to be able to draw I think that's really important and you need to be able to see the colors so the way I teach now is imagining that the person I'm teaching doesn't know anything about colors or shading can't draw you know and that's the way I approach it now so I'll go into my classes and I'll have a pattern almost like you know a dressmaking pattern but it'll be a pattern that they'll have to follow through and then they'll have to go through step by step with me like okay we're going to layer our yellows first and then we're going to layer our greens and we'll go on from there so it's really about simplifying the process and then getting them to make mistakes on purpose and going from there I mean, yeah. are, you, are you concentrated mostly on the technical part of it, on explaining how to like handle the machine properly, how not to get those uh, first things that you yes. need to get? The first, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, or is it more about like how to properly blend colors, how to achieve the look that they want to achieve? What do you concentrate more on? Well, at the beginning, it's about the technical side. So it's about how to do the free motion embroidery because a lot of people who come to free motion embroidery are quite familiar with sewing machines and how to sew but they're used to having their feed dogs up and just feeding it through the machine like this so the idea that you've got this control to to move your fabric can be very alien to them so it's about making them comfortable with that process when they come in first and showing them that yes when the machine is doing this free motion embroidery it doesn't want to do it so oftentimes it'll resist what you're trying to tell it to do. And about getting them confident with that. So I think when they have a pattern to follow, when they have a template, it makes it easier because it takes away the fear of getting things wrong. Um, and then a lot of the time, what I would do is I'd do that first beginner's class. And then I'd follow that up with a thread blending class and then another class on kind of really looking at fur so that each time that they do a class, they're learning something a little bit more. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I love teaching. It's really lovely. Do you ever like look at what your students make and you're like blown away? Like, I didn't see that coming sort of thing. Um, I love the interpretations of it. 
So sometimes you'll have somebody who you'll give them a template and they'll do something totally different with it. So you might have a daisy and it'll be yellow and white and, you know, <clears throat> just teaching them simple processes. And they might just take that on a totally different plane and maybe stitch it onto a bag or something where it looks totally different. So I love that. And I love seeing where they go with their projects. It's really interesting. You mentioned you mentioned that your kids were helping you with some of your yes. projects, and you men you mentioned that you also teach children the um, art classes. Yes. Do, you, do you think like anybody can learn your what you do? Yeah, I I think it's a really open to everyone to learn, and as adults, we're really afraid of making mistakes. So I think kids are brilliant at. at you know just embracing things and if you say to them that yes you can draw with a sewing machine they go oh okay you know there's no like what really you know they don't question it they just embrace it and they just go show me how to do it so um actually in a few of my classes I've been teaching them how to do hand stitching and needle felting and they love it and the things they make are amazing just so creative so, so I think everyone can learn do you now concentrate just on the freehand embroidery or do you do like do you ever try to combine other skills of yours like do you try other fiber arts yeah so I still do uh, needle felting and I do a lot of applique as well and fabric collage in my work and um, and recently I've tried to make more three-dimensional pieces so I find uh, using soluble uh, stabilizer is a really cool way to try and make them more sculptural so um, I've been using that and kind of stitching extra layers into pieces. So if I'm doing a bird with the wings, I'll, I'll make like extra feathers. And then when you wash away that stabilizer, you've got this real cool, uh, like almost a flat piece that you can you can manipulate to. I'll show you actually. So I have like a, a that's a robin that I'm working on at the moment. But if I was making this a soluble stabilizer, I'd have like extra um, wings here so that you can almost bend it around to make it more three-dimensional and I'm also trying to kind of weave wire through them as well so I think that's a great thing about being an artist or a crafter is that as you learn the skills you can just try and push them all the time and push the processes and see where they lead you and you know not being afraid of making mistakes and I think that that's the main thing that I've learned is going okay so look if it if it goes wrong it goes wrong and I learned, yeah, that doesn't work. But if it goes right, the possibilities are endless. And I mean, the more you can kind of just embrace that and explore the techniques, you know, it's, it's amazing, amazing what you can do. Well, you mentioned that the first idea came from you seeing some picture on Instagram. What yeah. role does Instagram or social media in general like plays in your life? How much how much inspiration it brings to you or how much frustration it brings to you at the same time <laughs> frustration is a great way to put it I think sometimes we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to kind of do those like our daily posts and our daily reels and I find that can be frustrating because sometimes it takes away from the work itself where you're so busy concentrating on trying to do a reel that you're maybe not focusing enough on you know making new work but I love Instagram I think it's a fantastic place to meet other makers and you know you might see someone doing something and you could message them and go how are you doing that or you know what are you using and um, I've connected with so many textile artists on on Instagram I find it really inspirational just to chat with people and you know see what they're doing and you know I think we were chatting before we came on just about meeting people in other countries and how this technology has made the world so much smaller and um, so I love it for that I'm just like seeing different ideas because, you know, I think sometimes as an artist, you could be working on something like a collection of wildlife and then you might see something totally different online and go, oh, I want to try that. And, you know, that could be almost like your weekend work where you're making something really funny or because sometimes I do um, portraits of celebrities as well in stitched art, you know, just because it's, it's a bit of fun. And um, my kids love it. So I've done them of uh, Will Ferrell and Macaulay Culkin and um, Catherine O'Hara. And they're just really quirky. But, you know, that's the nice thing about Instagram and social media as well, is that there's you can put things up and people might go, oh, that's not what she usually does. It doesn't matter. It's, it's great to share it. 
follow um, up. So you mentioned that um, at the beginning that you love research, and at the beginning you were researching all the like all the mistakes and all the techniques. Yes. Is it difficult to find information just because like it's not something a lot of people do? Like, is it easier now? Is like how do you research? And um, I find YouTube is brilliant. Like like everyone, you know, you can you can Google how to build a house on YouTube. So I think for even free motion, you know, it might not be the exact video that you want to see, but it might just kind of give you a little hint. And um, you're right though, a lot of things are very difficult to find. Like, you know, if you've got a certain brand of sewing machine and something's wrong with that and you're Googling and Googling, you might not find the answer. So that can be frustrating. But I think that's great where from the, the textile point of view with communities on Instagram and Facebook, you might put a question in there and somebody will come back with an answer. And, you know, crafters are so kind and they're all willing to help with things as well. So I love that community network that you learn from social media. Um, but yeah, some things you just learn through mistake and you just learn through practice as well, where um, I know at the beginning I didn't even use stabilizer on my pieces and I couldn't understand why they were constantly buckling. And um, I was in a fabric shop and it was just by walking into the fabric shop and I was chatting to the girl and I was showing her my piece and I was going, I don't know what's going wrong. And she showed me stabilizer and I was like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of this. You know, such a novice, I had no idea. But um, yeah, fabric stores as well are amazing places just for connecting with people and, you know, learning about new materials and processes as well. Well, I mean, so you go from being an established artist with like exhibitions yeah. and like people knowing you, people buying your art, to going to becoming basically a rookie in something new. <laughs> Did you have the... Like, did you doubt yourself at any point? Did you doubt your sanity yeah. of going into something unknown and like new and spending so much time and hours on it? Yeah, 100% Arena. I remember like the first six months going, what are you doing? And saying it to myself on a daily basis. And then, you know, I'd have the sewing machine on one side of the, the studio. And actually, I didn't even have a sewing machine when I began. I bought myself a budget sewing machine I think it cost like 100 euro and all I knew was it had you could lift the feed dogs and you could attach a free motion foot and that's all I knew um and so it was really you know a leap of faith but I also knew I had to try it um so I mean I started with like three pieces of fabric and two different colors of thread and this budget sewing machine and I was just doing black outlines and everything so it was it was really uh basic but every time I did a piece, I learned a little bit more. And I kind of said to myself, OK, give it a year. If it doesn't work, then you have to go back and, and just paint more. And I always had the paints on the other side of the studio. So if there was a day that the, the sewing machine was having none of me and didn't want me working on it and all the mistakes were happening, then I knew I could just pick up a paintbrush and do a bit of that. And even now, I still do that work. Um, even this weekend, I kind of felt I had enough of sewing for a week. I had I was working on a really big project. And um, I think sometimes when you're working on a big project, you can almost feel drained. So I find now going back to painting is really easy, where it's almost like, oh, phew, I can just relax and do this bit and then go back over there to the stressful bit afterwards. So it's nice to have a mix of the two medias as well. What are you thinking about while you're sewing? Is it like technical thoughts of like this machine has to go this way or that way? Or like, are you in some meditative space thinking about something you saw on TV the night before or you're dreaming about the next project? Like what's in your head? It's all about fur, I think, is the best way to describe it. I know that sounds really weird, but because I do so many animals, um, like the the last biggest project I worked on was a bear. And the whole time I was making the bear, because he was a rainbow bear. So I was looking at this grizzly bear who was red and brown and black. And I turned him purple and pink and green and yellow and blue. And literally it was all the direction of fur. So when I'm doing it, all I'm thinking is fur goes this way, fur goes that way, fur goes this way, fur goes that way. I mean, it is quite meditative as well, but it does sneak into the rest of your life. Like I find when I'm working on something that's all consuming like that and I'm going to bed, 
oh, I'm seeing in my eyes when I close my eyes is fur, fur or feathers. Or <laughs> so, and you're seeing all the colors as well. So yeah, they can take over a little bit. Um, and it's why I like to work on a few different pieces at the one time. So if I'm doing a really large portrait, I'll have a really tiny portrait alongside of it. So maybe like a bird or you know something smaller. Or sometimes I'll do a landscape alongside of a really big portrait because again, that's it's different. So if you get bored or frustrated, then you can move on to this other thing that isn't maybe as frustrating. <laughs> Yeah. How do the ideas come to you? Like, is it something you take a walk, you see something and you have to like take a picture? Do you write them down? Do you plan ahead of yeah. time? Like, it's, it's really organic, if I'm honest. Um, a walks are a big thing. So I'll go out and I'll walk and I'll check the cameras and I'll see what's been on the cameras. But obviously we live in Ireland, so we don't have grizzly bears. <laughs> we don't have wolves. But, you know, I might like see you know, um, might go into a woodland area and think about what lives there. Or if you see a hole in the ground, I'll think, oh, what could have lived there? And um, that I get ideas from that and then I'll come home and I'll write them down. And um, sketching is my big thing. So I think I'm just addictive to creating, if I'm honest. So even if after spending a full day down here, I'll go up to our living room and I'll be watching Netflix and I'll still be sketching um, animals or birds or landscapes. And sometimes it can be the seasons as well. So like I was saying earlier on, that it's really sunny here in Ireland today. It's never like this. It's usually raining. And um, so if we get a really sunny day like this and the, the sunset is beautiful, I'll just be thinking about the colours. So if it's pink and purple and orange, I'll go, oh, what could be pink and purple and orange? And, oh, I really like that colour mix. And I'll do like lots of little swatches of colours that I like and see do they mix together. So it is a really organic process. Um, and like I was saying about the collection, so I'm working on the rainbow collection, but alongside that, I'll be doing like little bits and pieces that kind of capture my attention for a little bit of time. Do you ever get is, uh, artistic block when you like don't know what to make next or there's like no inspiration and you... Like... It's, it's more about deciding on what to make next. Um, and I find that always comes after a big piece. So... If I've had something that I've been working on for, say, a month, then I'll find it really, really difficult to choose what the next thing should be. Um, and I was always really, really good for never having um, unfinished products. You know, the way all crafters talk about UFPs and how, how many they have. I never had them until the last 12 months. And I have a little basket and it's like where all the animals go to die. So it's <laughs> little hordes of animals and they're all in a little basket over here and I keep saying okay I have to go back and finish them but I think they're the little things that get me through that artistic block where I'll start them you know when I'm feeling like I'm not happy with what I want to do or I don't I don't really feel too creative so I'll start something small and then I'll just go no <laughs> I'll throw it in the bin and then I'll have my big idea but I think it just helps to keep working so like when you did that Frankenstein project, you reused all the materials that you had at hand. Do you still do that? Do you still upcycle like all the materials that you find around you? Yeah, uh, that's my favorite thing to do. Um, I really, I hate waste. And in textiles, we have so much waste. I mean, you know, every time you cut a color thread on the machine, you end up with a big line of thread. So I have a giant jar, like most textile artists, that's just full with thread and I try and incorporate that into lots of pieces um, I'm really into ecology and conservation as well so um, one of the last pieces that I made was and I think I sent it to you it was an orangutan's head um, and I called it um, guardian of the jungle and that piece was really about waste and what you could use so when I'm making like the, the little robin that I showed you so I'd make that on a piece of fabric and then I'll cut the fabric away from him so I'll have this kind of like a an outline of fabric left behind so I keep all of those as well and I like to use those in fabric collages or like in the case of the orangutan I chopped up all different scraps that I had left around the place and I laid those all in the background like um, leaves all around the orangutan's head and then I emptied the big jar of thread and I had them spilling down along them as well and I also like to work with alternative materials. So this is what I was saying about 
because I come from an art background as opposed to a textile background, I don't really know the rules. So I want to just try different things like sewing paper together, um, toilet rolls. I use a lot of toilet rolls in my work as well and then paint over them. Um, fruit netting is brilliant and plastics are another one that I really like to use. Um, so I've made a, a few pieces on plastic waste and especially plastic oceans, you know, this whole thing about how the plastic goes into the ocean and then it doesn't erode. So I've been using things like saran wrap and bubble wrap and then melting them with the iron and stitching them together to make the sea. And I think it's a great way to, you know, bright, broaden people's awareness of waste. And also the fact that, yes, you can use this really horrible material, but you can turn it into something really pretty. And actually, because it doesn't erode, it will be here forever as this beautiful thing. So, you know, I think it's something we need to be more conscious of as as crafters and artists as well. You didn't have to worry about paying bills and feeding children and all that stuff. Is there like some dream project that you like always on the back of your mind that like if I had a couple years to burn and not nothing to worry about, this is what I would do? No, I don't I don't know. That's a really <laughs> good question. Um I don't know. I think I would just make giant, like huge portraits. I think that's one thing that um because you were worrying about the bills and you know that okay, this is gonna take two, three months to make that maybe it's not going to be as easy to sell. So I think, yes, if if that wasn't an issue, my work would be 10 times the size it is now. It would be huge. I would love to do that because there's something really powerful about like putting something huge through the sewing machine, trying to manipulate it. I think it's, it's just, uh, it'd be amazing to do something like that. Yeah, I'd love that. It is something with the big pieces though. Like when I was making the stag, my shoulders were so sore. I'd never done anything to that scale before. So when you're working with the embroidery hoops, you're just holding the hoop and you're moving it through and it's all very timid. But with the stag, it was like layers of thread, layers of material. Then I had wadding, then there was quilting, then there was like leaves and fruit netting on top. So it was really like <laughs> pushing it through. And my shoulders were so sore for about a week and I couldn't understand why. And then it was, I was lugging this giant quilt around and I was going, okay, that's, that's, that's why my shoulders are there. <laughs> well, like if you think about your life four years ago, right? Or whenever you started the embroidery, you were like set in your ways. Like you were yeah. somewhere, let's say, closer to the top of your painting career. Yeah. Can you imagine yourself not embroider? Like, can you imagine no. the next step to like after that? No, I couldn't. And I think it was it was always coming because even with that last exhibition, I loved what I did. But as I was finishing it, I just knew I, I like I was looking at all my paints and all my materials and it was almost like I hated them. I couldn't go over there. So rather than, you know, never doing that again, I knew that trying something different would unleash more creativity. And it really has. Um, I think with textiles, you know, you can you can never be fulfilled because there's so much possibility, you know, even looking at your piece in the background there, you know, that's something else that I haven't tried. And that's something else that I could do and I can try and incorporate into my work. And um, as I mentioned, the three dimensional side of things, that's something I'd like to give a go to as well. It's just so many possibilities and you're still using everything that you've learned before you know you're still using paint in your work sometimes I paint the backgrounds of my portraits or um I might like be sketching something out at the at the beginning and that's that stage as well but I think I just love working in layers and I think that's what was for sure frustrating me about the painting is that I'd done maybe three or four layers and it still wasn't right whereas now I maybe do the painting on the fabric and then I stitch over it and then I felt over it and then I might applique over it again and then I'll cut it all up but I'll stitch it to it again so I think it's just you can just add so much more to it you feel like that. you're happy with uh, where you are right now like do you see yourself approaching like the peak of your knowledge in this field or 
is there like awesome. some dreams that you have like oh i wish i could do this and that and this and that um i i actually don't think i've reached where i need to go so i think it's just one of those things that you just need to keep driving yourself and i really do think it's like an addiction so it's, it's like one of those things where the more you do the more you want to do so it's it's not even an, an ambitious thing it's just um a creative a creative thing yeah so you're following the creative process and you're making things and while you're making that one piece you're really 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 happy and you're loving it and you're going oh my god this is amazing it's coming out really well and then you finish that and you go oh that's gone now what am I going to do now so then you need to go on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing so I think even like when I'm 90 and the arthritis is really bad because it's bad now <laughs> I'll still be like pushing things through the sewing machine and still not being 100% happy. Well, if somebody like 100 years from now found a couple pieces of that you embroidered, yeah, which pieces would you want them to find? Oh, it's a really good question. So I think um, my stag would be one and um, the orangutan would definitely be another one. There's certain ones that I just really feel a connection with. So maybe not so much the little pieces because I think as you said earlier some pieces don't take as long and when you spend more time in a piece and you've put more thought into the piece and you're you're constantly like I'll have it here in the studio and I'll walk past the room and I'll still be going in and tinkering with it they're the pieces that really take your heart so yeah the stag the orangutan is one as well um, and another one which I made for my daughter so she's a really big environmentalist. She's 13. So she's at that lovely age. <laughs> she is in love with Greta Thunberg, the uh, environmentalist. So there, two years ago, I created a portrait of her and it was all based on those environmental issues. So I made a sheet of handmade paper out of paper waste. And then I stitched her portrait into that. So that's one I'm really proud of as well. And it was one of the first stitch portraits I ever did. So it was a really interesting thing to do because like flesh is really smooth, whereas fur is furry. So it was a funny one to try and capture skin through thread. And um, yeah, so very proud of that piece as well. And then there's other like little little pieces like that that would I'd have connections with the kids that I'd, I'd love. But really from an artistic point of view, I think the orangutan 100% the stag because there was so much work that went into it and then actually one other piece um so I created a hair out of old denim and fruit netting and lace and I call this piece the shape shifter because a lot of my work has connections to Irish mythology so in Ireland the hair is seen as this mystical creature and he shape shifts and changes and he can be good luck and I just really like that idea of you know the magic behind the animal um, and also the idea like you know we were kind of cleaning out the cupboards and it was denim and I thought oh denim is the worst in in you know in relation to textile waste and ecology so rather than you know get rid I said no we're keeping it and I'm going to reuse it so we stitched this lovely portrait of the hair onto the denim and then used the frayed seams for um like thistles and leaves so really proud of that piece as well of that one I'd forgotten about it <laughs> what's your plans for this year like is there anything exciting going on so at the moment I'm just working on this rainbow collection and I don't have a huge idea of where it's going to go because lockdown in Ireland has literally only just opened up and um, I had a huge exhibition of tech my first ever solo textile exhibition that was meant to happen um, and then it didn't happen because it happened virtually because of the lockdown. So that was really disappointing. It was for the European Capital of Culture and it was um, 12, 12 portraits of heritage breed sheep. And each sheep was made out of the wool from that particular breed. So say if you had um, a Herdwick sheep, it would be a stitch portrait of a Herdwick sheep, but his fleece would be made out of Herdwick wool. So that was really disappointing, but actually the reception to the work even online was amazing. All of the pieces sold, you know, that was great. So at the moment, I'm just kind of tinkering away with this 
rainbow collection. And I hope to have maybe 12 to 16 pieces. And then it's about having a show of those. That, that's what I really want to concentrate on. Well, I can't, I honestly can't wait to see what that collection. I would love to see it live, actually, because it just oh, like you. I've been studying it on your Instagram and like zooming in and trying to oh. see all the teaching there because just like yeah, it's the, really difficult, I think, sometimes as well to gather the scale of something on Instagram because you might look at something and you know think it's a meter by a meter, but maybe it's this size. But all of these ones are quite big as well, so that's why I'm kind of I do one big one. And then I'll do a few small pieces and then I'll do one big one. So it's 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 interesting. Yeah, it's it's nice to play around with. Well, I'm so glad I got to talk to you today and that oh, you to be a guest of my channel. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much for asking me. Your questions were amazing. I'll be thinking about them later on as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.